design and the different components that go into an application. Okay, great. Thanks for the recording. I was like, I think I forgot to hit record. <laughs> um, and yeah, so we're going to cover some of those. We won't get into the nitty gritty about things. So if you have specific questions about certain programs, um, I encourage you to connect with your either your career counselor um, within your college, um, work with your academic advisor, or even working with that direct program and, con and consulting with the admissions staff as well. So they can work with you and understanding maybe some of those like key specific questions that you have. Um, this is this session is provided by CLA Career Services, um, Speech Language Hearing Sciences Academic Advising, and the University of Minnesota Graduate School Admissions Office. Now I will, um, uh, Natasha and I will actually be doing, we will be monitoring the chat. So if you have questions along the way, feel free to submit your questions in the chat function, and then we'll get to your questions at the end. Okay, now I'll hand it off to Chiku. Introduce yourself and yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, first of all, I, I just want to thank Marlena and Natasha for allowing me to spend the afternoon with you all. Um, and just to share a bit about the graduate education process, the graduate application process as well. Um, I'll give give you all a brief introduction of just myself and, and uh, my path to being a uh, being in my role here at the, uh, at the graduate school. Uh, again, my name is Chiku Lee. I first started um, as uh, a graduate assistant or an administrative fellow with the Graduate School Admissions Office. And through that, I was able to then uh, receive a full-time position with the Graduate School Admissions Office. And now I've transitioned into my role into the Graduate School Diversity Office as a diversity outreach and recruitment coordinator. And what we do, of course, you know, being from the graduate school is really looking at ways and how to best uh, efficiently and effectively assist uh, graduate students in their process for applying into graduate school and also uh, getting them matriculated into and then really working with the program so that the graduate school and the various programs that you all be entering uh, can really understand the the process and how to be successful as a graduate student. So not only are we providing sort of admissions tips and services, but we also provide um, academic and professional support, um, such as you know resume writing, such as creating your individual development plan, um, such as writing services. So really, you know, many things that you you may be getting as an undergraduate student, but but then at the graduate level. And what we really focus on too is, you know, after your program, how do you do then transition into the prof professional world in industry or academics, or how do you then transition into be uh, becoming maybe an advisor or a faculty member? And so these are just some snippets of how the graduate school can assist you in your process um, of, of looking at programs and then continuing to be a, a student at the graduate level. Um, but with that, again, um, this, this presentation, uh, I'll try to whip through it in about 45 minutes or so. Any questions that you all have, um, feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A function, and our, our host here can help uh, us filter through those questions at the very end. Or if there's something pressing that you all want to bring up right away, uh, feel free to just you know, sort of stop me, Marlena and Natasha, and uh, I'll, be answer, I'll be able to answer those questions right away. Um, but before we begin, um, we want to give uh, an acknowledgement to the spaces in which uh, we occupy and really acknowledging that the University of Minnesota Twin Cities is built um, within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. And it is important for us to really acknowledge the people whose land we live on, we learn from, and we work with to really seek to improve and strengthen our relationships with our tribal nations. Um, we also acknowledge that our words are not enough, and we must ensure that our institution uh, provide the support, resources, programs, and spaces to really increase the access to um, all aspects of higher education for our American Indian students, staff, faculty, and community members. And so I'd like to really just begin uh, with that statement there. Um, but 
you know, one of the first things, and I think uh, one of the first questions that uh, you all might have is, you know, really why graduate school? You know, what are some of the main reasons why you might want to be spending another maybe two to three years or maybe four to six years to really, um, you know, continue to be a student? And some of the obvious, of course, are earning potential, um, future employment. You know, these are two of the very obvious ones. And, and that's whether you're seeking really just an uh, increase of pay or you're trying to broaden your horizon of career choices and industry. Um, also, additional reasons could be getting, gaining a global perspective um, while pursuing graduate education. You know, you'll have more opportunities to really engage with students and scholars from all across the country, across the globe. And going back to that future employment, um, pillar there is you, you don't know if you'll be working you know just at the national level or internationally so um, graduate education allows you to really expand that global education piece and really provide you a global, global perspective um, and then of course sometimes it's really just um, a requirement you know whether you want to become a school teacher whether you want to become a certified in a certain place of employment you might need to go get additional schooling beyond just a bachelor's. Um, in addition to that, it could be research. Uh, you might have an interest in doing research or becoming an expert or specialize in a particular area. Uh, it could be that, um, you know, it very simply could just be your own personal goal, um, just something that you want to strive towards, something that you've sort of had in the back of your mind that you, you feel like a graduate degree or graduate education could really help uplift you as an individual person, but also help uplift your community and family. And so, you know, these are just some of the core reasons. Of course, everyone has a different reason to, to pursuing graduate education, but um, the main ones I would say really are earning potential um, and then if you want to stay at a research institution um, or go into the academic world, um, research is definitely another uh, reason as well. Um, and also to highlight just the value and importance of, um, you know, graduate education that I would say that, you know, the system and society puts on it. Um, I want to um, take us through this, and, you know, very simple graph here. It's taken from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics and showing the unemployment rates and earning, earnings by educational attainment. And this is in 2019, but we update it every year. And every year, it's it's really been a consistent um, bar graph. But it really just shows that the higher degree you earn, the lower the percentage of your unemployment rate becomes, right? And one of the things that I'd really like to note here, I don't know if you all can see my cursor here, but if you're just looking at the bachelor's and uh, master's degree, the unemployment rate percentages is, you know, pretty close, you know, um, to, you know, 2.2% and 2%. However, if you just scroll over to the median usual weekly earnings, you'll see a nice increase of change of about $250. And of course, as you go up in degree level, um, your salary requirements or, you know, what the industry or what the workplaces that you'll be applying to, they'll have to meet you at your degree level as well. And so this is the nice big sort of exchange and jump. But of course, professional doctoral, doctoral degrees here, you'll see it's it's quite similar. But when you're look, looking at one master's level to a professional doctoral level, there's also a big gap here too. And so just to go back to one of the main reasons why folks really you know, think about pursuing graduate education after the bachelor's, whether that's you're taking a year off or whether you're going into a master's or PhD program right away. Um, one of the other, you know, big questions that we do get, um, especially at, at a large Big Ten Research One institution is, what's in a degree? You know, how many different types of post uh, bachelor degrees can you, uh, can you sort of look at and, and pick and choose on what to obtain? And here at the University of Minnesota, we, we, what we really like to say is at the master's level, and taking between one to two years of full-time study, you're you're really working towards a defense, a thesis defense, or passing your comprehensive exam. And at this point, we consider you know you as someone who's taking knowledge in, because as a student, you're really essentially engaging in an extra two years of focused or specified learning. Um, meaning that you know you're you're learning on how to become a researcher, you're learning on how to become a practitioner. 
but you're not necessarily um, being asked to produce a new theory. You might find a new theory along the way, but you're not being asked to do that. And so during this time, you're really taking foundational courses um, in, in that master's program. And then depending on you know, the path or the plan that you choose, whether that's a plan A, plan B, or plan C, it'll then require supplemental like research methods courses. Um, and then whether you're doing a thesis or comprehensive exam or a capstone project, that's how you sort of fulfill all of your master's requirements. Mm -hmm. At the doctoral level, which can take between four to six years, this time we would really consider it as taking a uh, giving knowledge back, right? Because you're taking this time to really be a part of that academic field. Uh, you're engaged in thorough research and scholarship, and you really want to be someone who be, could be credibly referenced or resourced when, you know, for example, when you're writing a research paper, you find all these lists of uh, research and you have to sort, source them in like APA or MLA citation format. And so you're working your way towards there to do publications as well. And at this, at this level, you're really, really engaged and you're really taking a deep dive into your academic interest. Um, you've essentially sort of like covered the landscape of your research or that, or that focus of your research. You then go work with your advisor, you find a committee member or committee team and then they now approve your research findings and um, you become someone who can then in your dissertation defense uh, to being able to make those you know, you know, valid arguments to your research and findings. So masters and PhD, if you wanna make that you know, simple distinction is masters taking knowledge in, PhD uh, doctoral giving knowledge back. Um, and then, of course, you know, you have your professional degrees as well. You have your post baccalaureate certificates and professional at the professional level. You could associate that with like your your MDs, your medical doctorates, uh, becoming a, a nurse, your law degree, your JD degree, uh, the master's of business. Um, and these would take more practical training, um, not so much research, but. You'll also see that it might take a little bit longer or shorter. It might cost a little bit more. But if we were just to think back to that bar graph slide that I was showing you, most of the times professional degrees, you you know get a higher salary at the end of your um, studies as well. And then post baccalaureate uh, certificates, that's um, more so of like a teaching licensure or a certificate or a getting an advancement in your um, career field. And so these could take maybe, I would say about a year or like maybe uh, 24 to 36 credits. Um, and so that's the length of time it, it kind of takes to fulfill a post baccalaureate. So these are all what's in degree and at the University of Minnesota and, and at other large research institutions, you'll find that they offer uh, all these types of degrees as well. Um, the next big question is, you know, I'm, I've gone through undergrad, you know, I want to go to grad school, but how do I pay for graduate school, right? Going through undergrad is a big expense already. And, you know, you, you may be familiar with grants and, and, and federal funding sources and loans or personal loans. Um, but the ways in which you fund your graduate education is similar. But Another, uh, some of the uh, unique things about graduate education are opportunities for you to also gain skills as a teaching assistant or research assistant. And so, you know, if, if we were to sort of just go through the cycle of ways to fund your, your graduate education, you know, we'll, we'll most likely want to avoid the loans. We'll try to look for uh, fellowships or scholarships that um, at the graduate school level, most of the times when you're being admitted to a PhD, you're probably applying to be considered for a fellowship and you're applying to then be nominated for one. At the undergraduate level, sometimes you're coming um, and you're searching for fellowships um, outside of the institution you're applying for it. But at the graduate level, most of the time it's awarded to you based on your academic performance, based on your the potential of you becoming a sort of exceptional student within that program. And then, and then of course, campus employment, graduate assistantships and campus employment. Um, 
TAs, teaching assistant, RAs, research assistant, they're mostly um, provided at the PhD level. However, uh, another way to fund your education is through an administrative fellowship, which is how I was able to fund my graduate education or my master's level degree. And what it is, it's, it works just like a TA ship and RA ship, except you're not working within an academic unit. You might be working within an administrative unit. So for me, that was the graduate school admissions office. And in those appointments, you either are given a 25% appointment, which means you're working 10 hours a week of the work week. So 25% of the 40 hour work week, that's 10, or you're doing 50% of the work week. So that's 20 hours of the 40, 40 hour work week. And at the 25% level, you're getting partial of your tuition paid for by, that, by the institution or that working unit. At 50%, you're getting all of your tuition covered. And in both positions, you're also getting an hourly stipend. So essentially, you're getting your tuition covered. You get paid to work with that administrative unit, for example, to graduate school, or it could be career service, or it could be within your um, student services in your college, right? Um, and all those packages, along with the TA ship and RA ship, tuition, health care um, are covered. Um, uh, you know, you get the hourly salary and you also learn a skill along the way. And so a lot of times, you know, folks are thinking, you know, well, I don't want to just go to school and not have any um, work experience and having and so having an administrative fellow or working in, an, in a unit that's that's not associated with the TA ship or RA ship means that you're also getting that work experience along the way. Um, and to, to look for that here at the University of Minnesota, you simply just go to our Office of Human Resources website. And when you're looking for um, essentially job opportunities, you'll, you'll be looking for tags that say, that says graduate assistant. So for example, when I was looking for graduate assistantships, there was a position where I could be ordering mice for their, their lab. And of course I didn't get it. I had no experience in ordering mice for, for lab work, but I applied anyways, just because I needed a way to fund my education. And of course, you know, you get that interview, you go the, through the whole application process and everything. Uh, unfortunately for me, and, and you know, I, I think good for them that they knew that I, I had no experience in ordering my they didn't select me, but I was fortunate enough to then be able to work with the graduate school admissions office, which is much more related to the current skills that I was coming in with uh, through my undergraduate experience. Um, also, if you're looking at, um, we have this link CUSP funding resources, which links to our graduate school webpage. We also have, um, you know, additional resources for fellowships and funding on, at the graduate school level. And so if you have a moment, take, take your time to, to look through there as well to see if there are any fellowship opportunities. Most of the times it's like you're coming in with a fully funded package. And then if you're looking for like travel grants or, you know, other more specific uh, um, scholarships and fellowships, you then will have to apply for. Uh, and they are awarded maybe sometimes like $1,000 or $800 or $1,500, depending on the uh, award that they've been given that year. But that those are some of the ways to pay for graduate education. You know, of course, you want to stay away from the loans part there. Uh, but it takes a little bit of digging and also doing your own research there. Um, so after, you know, you've decided that, okay, you want to pursue graduate school, you figured out how to pay for it. Um, how do you then choose a program that really fits for you and speaks to, you, you know, your character as a student and also what you want to do? And there are a number of factors. I'm saying that you have to consider all these bullet points but you know, really pick out the ones that really stick out to you and why you're choosing to be a part of a program or to being a part of an institution. Just to give you some examples for me in, in selecting my institution or selecting the University of Minnesota as a graduate um, institution to, to be a part of um, was of course, you know, the location 
um, for me, uh, the faculty and, uh, and staff for me, and the rankings for me. And so the University of Minnesota, me being from the Twin Cities, I've, I've always wanted to be a part of, the, uh, you know, I've always wanted to be a gopher. And so I was fortunate enough to uh, get into my program. Um, and then, you know, also the University of Minnesota, as far as the program that I was applying to um, was, you know, highly reputable. And then there were also faculty and staff that I knew that I'd wanted to work with uh, just by, you know, having read some of their materials and research. Um, you know, but maybe for you, other things that you might want to consider if it's not the you, but elsewhere, maybe location, maybe you want to go to the East Coast or West Coast, you know, maybe you do want to stay in the Midwest, but go to like Chicago or something. Um, so location can be one. Um, test scores are these, you know, do these institutions, you know, do they really look at GRE scores and, and graduate level test scores heavily? If you don't feel like, you know, you're, that's a strong suit for you, you might be choosing a program that might not be needing GRE scores. So for example, many of the University of Minnesota's programs, you know, they're reconsidering um, graduate level test scores just, just because we're going with a more holistic approach to reviewing applications. So you'll want to know how that institution or that program reviews applications as well. And then of course, <clears throat> If, if um, you know, you have any questions about the program, other, you know, you could certainly reach out to the graduate students there um, just to see what their experience is like at that institution. And a lot of times they might have their graduate students names and emails listed on their program's website because they're doing really interesting research. And so a lot of students could then take up the opportunity to reach out to those graduate students just to get a real feel for how it's like to be a student there. Um, if there's a faculty member that you really want to work with, um, you know, feel free to you know uh, get to know their research and maybe send them an email as well, just to say that you know you're really interested in the area in which you're working for, uh, working in, and you might want to be a part of that program. So certainly a lot of things to consider, and also when you're going through this process, don't feel as if you know. Um, just because you get into a program, you have to select that program right away. Make sure that that program fits you and your needs as well. Chief, um, we do have a good yeah. question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, get to it since it's kind of going off like the different factors. So the question is, if your undergraduate grades aren't that great, could doing well on your GRE help you? Or does it depend solely on how you did it as an undergrad? Mm, absolutely. You know, at the University of Minnesota and going back to that holistic review, um, I could tell you that, um, you know, your GPA isn't, it's important, but it's, all, it's also not everything. Um, and all of these components to an application in which we'll get to too, is that they all should be able to speak to your, your, your love, your whole set as a graduate student, right? And so, Let's just say that you had a bad GPA when you were a freshman and sophomore because you didn't know what program you wanted to be a part of or you had to change a major. But in your junior and senior year, when you found your footing and you got into the right program, um, you showed a consistent in improvement in your GPA or your grades. And so that's something that programs might be looking at, too, to show that, you know, not only does a student, um, you know, found themselves, but they also showed grit and um, you know, an ability to, you know, be more exceptional per semester. Of course, you know, if you're able to score highly on a test score or, you, and, you know, you, you're just really good at test taking, um, that'll also be to your benefit as well. Uh, it'll complement not only, you know, your application, but your GPA as well. I, I see another question maybe in there. I don't know if it's, um, closely associated with this previous question, but uh, I could address it now if, if you all think so. Yeah, so what would be considered a good or competitive GPA? Mm -hmm. um, I feel like, yeah, I, I do feel like most programs, they will state that you need a minimum GPA of 3.0. Yeah, um, that's, that's usually the number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's usually the number right like a b average student you know 
Um, I, I can just share with you from my example and of being in the admissions office and my in my own personal path to grow and getting into graduate school is I didn't have a 3.0 GPA in my undergraduate studies. I had a 2.95. Now that was it's close, but you know when I found my right program, I was able to articulate that um, in my personal statement and then also other components to your application. It's not just your GPA. It's like your letters of recommendations, your personal statements. Maybe there's a diversity statement. Maybe you've taken a gap year and um, you have work experience now. So a whole host of things uh, that, that programs should really consider. Uh, but but just to keep us you know in line with the time here, I think we have about 15 minutes left. I'm about halfway there, and so we'll have plenty of time for uh, time for questions as well. But just some of the things that you should be thinking about when completing your application. Um, you know, you all are here in this session today, so I know that you all are you know getting a head start and thinking about this early in the process. But what we need at the University of Minnesota Graduate School Admissions Office is really um, you know, your completed application and then also your unofficial transcripts. So unofficial transcripts, meaning just your academic record, and that's whether you're applying here at the University of Minnesota or whether you're applying elsewhere at a different institution. So I speak a lot about the U of M or I draw I use us as an example, but I'm, I'm hoping that this could also be transferable into you know, wherever you might be wanting to apply to. And then also, after you've looked at the graduate school admissions office's um, application requirements, you also want to look at the program or the programs that you're looking at and just see what they're requiring as part of the application. Um, most of the time, you know, the program and the graduate school, they sort of, you know, speak the same language and, and the needs and requirements, but some programs, they might require more or less recommendations, more or less references, it might require um, specific uh, statement prompts that you have to answer. Um, they might just, or other programs might just have a general statement prompt that, that they'll need you to answer. Other times, some programs might require an interview depending on the, the program that you're looking to get into. Um, depending on the program too, they might be wanting to know your work experience. So you wanna really pay attention to the program specific requirements. And then, you know, because you've, you've sort of been early on the process, make sure you just really review your application because it's really like the first assignment that you're given as, you know, an applicant, believe it or not. Um, you're not even a student yet in the program, but, you know, it really shows to your ability to really putting in the effort to put in a complete application. Um, and then, you know, of course, applying early and applying by the deadline. Sometimes applications, they have early deadlines for fellowship considerations. So you want to pay attention, attention to that deadline. And then typically at the U of M, it's like December 1st or December 15th deadline. If you can get your application in by then or before then, that's great. If it's, you know, getting close to that deadline and you're like a few days late, you know, at that point, you'd really want to be in touch with the program to see how the application review process is like. And if, you know, you should consider paying that $75 application fee or not. So that's just the, the, the brief overview of the deadline and timelines. Uh, I, uh, we briefly touched on this, but you know, what all goes into the application, what are programs looking for? Again, you know, it's very holistic, you know, as, as you could just see from diagram here, you know, not one piece, not one slice is bigger than the other because all of these elements are, you know, I would say as equally as important, but some of the big things um, that, you know, people think about are, you know, GPA. Okay, if I have a GPA, uh, if I have a low GPA, am I showing consistent improvement? You know, if you have that box sort of checked, then, you know, you might feel good about yourself. If um, as an undergraduate student, you want to go into a research program, do you have undergraduate research experience? And so you want to look at undergraduate research experience opportunities here at the U of M. We have those over the summertime, too. So you want to uh, take a look at those. Typically, they're done in like the, the summer of your um, sophomore and junior years. Um, as far as research opportunities, if you're working with a faculty member already on research, you want to make sure that you highlight that as well. Um, if you have 
if you're going not into a research route, but a more professional route, make sure that you also have that professional experience as well and speak to that as well. Um, and then, you know, I, I think a big piece in, in almost every application, they require a personal statement, right? And so what goes into a personal statement and how do you write a good one? Uh, uh, again, you know, I want to preface that you want to look at your program's website to see if they have specific prompts that they want you to answer. But generally in a personal statement, you really want to speak to your whole ability, excuse me, as a graduate student, as a graduate student who can do research at the graduate level, who could be part of the sort of conversation and critiquing of disciplines at the graduate level. And so you might want to talk about your accomplishments, yes. Um, you might want to uh, talk about your research experiences, yes. But then you also want to maybe, you know, put in, um, you know, a few names that you re that you recognize or the program recognizes as far as faculty members that you want to work with or program people that you want to work with or the type of research that you want to do. And then, you know, it's never too late to start look, thinking about your future and what you want to do with your degree. And so also providing them with um, sort of a framework or, you know, the groundwork of what you want to be doing after you get your master's or a PhD, your career path, your trajectories, uh, that might also be helpful. Um, and then, you know, again, to this demonstrating your write, writing ability, you know, again, submitting, submitting an application and, and your personal statement is really kind of like your first writing assignment. Um, and so you want to stick it to those prompts and you want to make sure that you're submitting a really good personal statement that speaks to who you are as a student, who you are as a researcher, who you want to work with, and how you want to sort of just impact the future. That's whether individually or at the, you know, sort of research academic level. Um, and make sure that you look over it numerous times. Make sure that once you have your personal statements, you have maybe uh, a writing services individual look over it, or maybe having faculty members look over it. Um, before you, you know, submit that application. Um, and so this leads into the next important element to um, any application, especially at a big research institution like the U of M are, you know, uh, letters of references, you know, who do I ask to, to write me a letter of recommendation and how many? So depending on the program, you know, that'll answer you uh, for you the how many and, and, and who, right? So are they looking for just academic people or are they looking for, you know, maybe one academic person and one professional person? Um, for me, going into an academic program, I, I needed two letters of recommendations for my program. And so I reached out to my faculty members at my undergraduate institution. And uh, to be able to do that comfortably, you want to make sure that you still have a relationship with, you know, the faculty members or the professors that you sat in class with and you found that those classes for you were really memorable for you and you maybe you had a good relationship with that faculty member or maybe have an academic advisor who feel like could really speak to your strengths as, as a student and as a graduate student and researcher and so you want to keep these folks sort of in your back pocket and just kind of keep them updated to what you're doing and in, in your career uh, trajectories your undergraduate um, um, you know path so that they know that, okay, you know, once, you know, um, you're getting ready to submit your application, they're already aware that, oh yeah, this student, they were an excellent student in my class and they could, they would be a great fit for a program. Um, so you really want to maintain contact, keep in touch with your advisors, uh, academic and faculty advisors. And then um, if it's a supervisor, you want to make sure that, you know, you keep, uh, keep in touch with them as well. Um, and then again, once you have your personal uh, statement written, make sure that you share that with your uh, letters or reference writers so that they get that the full picture of not just you sitting in their classroom, but also, oh yeah, you know, this person wants to do X, Y, Z in the future. That's why they're going to graduate school. And that's why they would be a good fit for this program. And, you know, sometimes faculty members, they might know each other. Um, you might not know it, but, you know, they might be in the same discipline. They might know each other, know of the same names. And so they might be able to put in a good word for you. 
or they might know that, you know, maybe this faculty member is sitting in a review committee or something like that. And so um, just make sure that you maintain contact with your uh, letters of reference writers. Um, just to then again, go over very quickly the timeline, application timeline here. Um, summer here, we're at the end of spring. So you, you all are actually really ahead of the game as far as preparing your application and applying. Uh, summertime, that's when um, you're really, you know, working on your personal statement and you're re really sort of putting your team together, I would say, as far as who do you want to review your letters, who do you want to be um, your letter recommendation provider, uh, whether that's you wanting to take a gap year or that's you wanting to go into uh, graduate school right away. So make that plan early on in, in the summertime. And then by the fall or, or winter time, December 1st deadline or, or that November deadline, uh, you want to make sure they're ready to submit the application. And one question that a lot of students have is, you know, when I submit my application, do my letters recommendations need to be in along with my application? And that's a, really a question for the program specifically. Some programs, they understand like faculty members, they don't, um, they might not have the time to, to submit their letter of reference for you right away. But that's why you also want to do that early game planning earlier in the summer, right? So you want to get those folks sort of in line to say that, okay, it's September or it's August, can you, you know, work on my letter for me so that I can submit it in by November or December. Um, and then other programs, you know, um, they're much more strict. They could be like, you know, your application needs to be fully completed along with your personal statement, transcripts and everything and letters of recommendations before we could start looking at it even. And, you know, that might speak to the competitive nature of the program. So you want to be aware of that as well. Uh, typically for programs by over the winter break and by, by spring, they like to give out decisions by that time or have made a decision so that um, students who are receiving funding uh, can then make a decision on whether they want to go to this in institution versus another, depending on the funding package that they'll be receiving. And so there's that special April 15th deadline that is really for programs to say, okay, if I'm giving you know this student a funding package, I have to give them up until April 15th to make a decision on whether they come to the University of Minnesota or another program because of the funding uh, stipulations that's tied to it. So they can't force you to choose any program versus another. That's why it goes back to that choosing a program that fits for you, right? Um, and then you know once. April 14th arrives or after that date, you then make a decision to go to which institution that provides you all of those pieces that fit best for you. Location, funding, cost, tuition, where am I going to live and eat, um, you know, the research of that institution. And then come summer, you know, you go through orientation and registration all over again. And then fall, you start. And that's the whole year cycle of an application process. And so it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of good hard work, but you know, we're here to assist you at the graduate school, uh, graduate school admissions office, graduate school diversity office. I'm sure um, Natasha and Marlena is, is, will forever be your champions in, in assisting you as well. Um, but that's, that really takes us to the end of our PowerPoint slides here. Um, again, things to think about finding opportunities, location, uh, make a visit over the summertime if it's not at the U of M, you wanna go elsewhere. Um, you know, who do you wanna work with ultimately? What do, you, what do you want to get out of the program? Um, and then you could also, you know, ask your current faculty members advice for like, oh, is this program and I don't know, like on the East Coast good, or, you know, is it reputable? And they can give you sort of the insights to higher ed in that way. Um, and so that, that really takes us to the end. Um, our email is your GS Quest. Um, I'll put in my email in the chat as well. Awesome, thanks Chiku.
that was great. I think it was a good refresher for me too, to like, again, the timeline and understanding the different components. Um, and if you have, I mean, one thing we didn't cover is prerequisites. And the reason why we don't talk about that now is because that is very specialized and very specific to the program that you're applying for. And so I know there was a question in here about, you know, does it look poorly to have an SN on your transcript in a few classes during COVID? And um, it, it's okay to have a few of them. And the program will state that too, if not on their website, definitely connect with their admissions folks. They're paid mm -hmm. to connect with prospective students. I know, and you know, I'm looking at the medical school right now at the U of M and on their website, they said that they will accept SN, so pass fail grades courses mm -hmm. taken in the spring and summer of 22, in 2020. So spring and summer of 2020, including prerequisites. So it's really good to get that information early on mm -hmm. um, as you are planning, especially if those programs have prerequisites that you need. Um, anything else to add to that, um, Natasha and Chiku? You know, Marley, I, I certainly agree with that. I think that everyone knows that this past year has been a really interesting odd year for a lot of folks thinking about graduate school. The great thing about the graduate education is it's it's always going to be here, whether you decide to take how many years off. Um, but just know that programs are aware of these things um, during this time as well. You of course want to pay attention pay attention to their websites, but you know in almost every application uh, system too, there are opportunities for you to submit an extenuating circumstances letter just to give a brief, you know, explanation of, you know, why you might have had a hard time your freshman and sophomore year, but, you know, you doing really well now or how this last COVID-19 year was like for you and how you continue to show your grit and your perseverance as a student throughout this time too, even if you had an SN on your academic record. Um, you know, it's it's really due to the times and not, you know, it doesn't speak to your performance as a student at, at all. So extenuating circumstances, that's definitely uh, another place where you can, you know, tell them a little bit about yourself as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up to you too, because um, a lot of my students in the speech language hearing sciences major are interested in speech language pathology uh, programs and often um, they usually observe their respected speech language pathologists at the undergraduate level but due to COVID-19 restrictions they haven't been able to do that. I'm sure that's really um, a common trend in other majors and other like pre-health type of fields um, and you know, I've been saying similar pieces that you have as well of like there's other pieces that we can also talk about in your application. Um, and this has been a, you know, worldwide pandemic, unfortunately, um, and graduate schools very much know that. So every intention that you showcase that you, you know, want to pursue that or do informational interviews at the least, anything like that still shows your intention. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Again, you know, we're here to really support your pathway to graduate education, whether that's tomorrow or, you know, five years from now. Um, so feel free to, to, you know, send us an email or just start your application, save it. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. We do have two more questions here. So the first is, would all of the stated options for funding be enough to cover graduate school tuition rates for international students? You know, I would say international students, it's um, more of a specific um, sort of situation in, for me as far as my expertise as well. Um, but I would say that if you're getting a TA ship or RA ship, it would cover your full tuition, even as an international student. Um, however, you know, all these, I didn't know what student fees expenses go along with being that as well. Um, but we have, let's see, two administrative fellows right now in our graduate school admissions office, and they are international students. And um, as far as I'm aware, uh, we all get similar packages as far as tuition coverages, um, healthcare and a stipend. Um, but, but then, you know, I don't know what other expenses that uh, they have versus me, but 
Uh, if you're getting TA ship or RA ship, you're definitely covered uh, pretty much all of the way. Yeah. Yeah, I find that my international students who are applying for like professional programs, so outside of, you know, the PhD, um, mm -hmm. and which, you know, where the graduate assistantships, research assistant assistantships, and TA ships aren't like available to these more I mean, professional programs. It has been more challenging, unfortunately. Um, yes. I, yeah, unless there's like a third party scholarship program, because if the program and the institution isn't offering the scholarship, there are sometimes other third party organizations that mm -hmm. offer these scholarships. It's open to um, international students. And so it, it's a bit tricky, unfortunately. And I know that it is, you know, much more challenging, especially, you know, particularly at the master's level too, for, and I would say across all disciplines to get that TA ship or RA ship once you're admitted into the program right away, because those are generally reserved for PhD students, right? Um, because we are a research one institution, um, but whether you're at a master's level uh, professional research program, um, if you don't get a TA ship or RA ship, there are definitely opportunities for you to get an administrative fellowship. Um, and so you don't necessarily work within your department or your academic program, but you're working in different you know, administrative units. So that's whether you're ordering mice for a lab or that's whether you're working in uh, an admissions office like I did. Um, the, fun, the funding packages are the same. You're still covered the same, international or domestic. It's just that you're not a TA or RA. Um, but you get that you know, work experience. Yeah. Awesome, thank you. Okay, next question. If you have a desire to go to an outside program, when do you recommend that we fill out transfer class forms to compare if we fulfill the prerequisites? Mm -hmm. You know, that's a great question. Um, you know, if you can do that early on and work with um, maybe an, uh, a transfer specialist or academic advisor there who's willing to work with you, then by all means do that. Sometimes institutions like to like assist their students first or, or after you're admitted into the program, then they'll review your transcripts. But for example, for us, um, at the grad school admissions office, a lot of students, um, particular inter international students, they would send us their undergraduate transcript because they went to a school outside of the US and they want to know if it's accredited at the, at the University of Minnesota's programs. And so we would look at, at them, we would do a screening for it because our purpose is to really assist prospective graduate students as well. Um, but if you're looking to transfer out, you would want to do that early on if you can. However, most of the times, um, your transfer credits, they're not reflected until after you're admitted into the program and you fill out paperwork so that it can be, show up on your transcript within that institution. So most of the times you have to be an admitted student first, and then that transfer process comes in afterwards. But um, so at the graduate level, there isn't like a transfer office necessarily for per se, like they have at the undergraduate level where you transfer from one community college to the U of M or something like that. At the graduate level, typically you're admitted to the program and you have X amount of courses from another institution. They would then look at that after you, you've been a part of the program, maybe a year or once you're ready to graduate and then they'll apply those credits to your U of M transcript. Yeah. Always keep your syllabus, that's the rule. <laughs> yeah. Always keep a copy of your course syllabus, um, put it into a drive, Google Drive, your U of M Google Drive, you'll, you will always have access to your University of Minnesota email um, and the drive. So I, I always recommend that. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a great question. I feel like you can answer this, Tsuchiku, is what would be some, some good things to talk about in your diversity statement? Mm -hmm. You know, the diversity statement question is always a sort of like um, nuanced one, right? Because um, sometimes when you're thinking about diversity, you're thinking about your experiences maybe as uh, 
maybe as a uh, student of color, maybe as um, someone who identifies by a particular gender or gender identity or anything like that, right? But what we're really looking for in a diversity statement really is, or what programs might be looking for is, you know, what are the diverse, diverse views and experiences that you have to really bring into the program to make that program a much better program or to transform the program to be a better program for students like yourself. So, you know, uh, for example, for me, I drew, I had a personal statement and I had a diversity statement. And within my personal statement, it talked about my academic performance as a student, research uh, interests, and what I want to do with my career. In my diversity statement, you know, I really spoke to, to you know, my experiences as a student, as a first generation student, as a student, um, you know, a, a child or refugee parent, as someone who's sort of navigated the system by myself and to really be able to reflect and say, hey, I, I sort of got here um, by my own sort of hard work, but also, also through the reflection of myself, the, the assistance that I received as far as motivation and also um, by, you know, the, the sort of good graces of my professors as well, being you know, willing, able to teach me. So, um, and then, you know, you could also talk about, you know, in your diversity statement, um, your experiences, maybe your first gen student, maybe you're, you uh, were a student leader and, you know, you had a transformative experiences as a student leader. And so it's really looking at, at the diversity of your experiences and how you can really make a program better, not just that I'm, I'm a, you know, like I'm a underprivileged or marginalized student. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Terrific question so far, everyone. Yeah, love that. I, I really appreciate how you shared that, you know, it's like the, the your diverse experience and how is that going to transform the program? Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't have to be anything, I always remind my students, like it doesn't have to be anything like extraordinary where you went abroad and you built this, I don't know, built okay. the school with the program, right? It can just be in those ordinary moments like, um, I, and a lot of my students during the summer who were applying for for uh, for graduate school, and this was during George Floyd. Mm -hmm. This was happening in our own backyards, um, and so you know, this student really spoke about the impact that that had on them, yeah. um, and just how it was just in the, my backyard having to unpack. And this was a white student too, who mm -hmm. was unpacking their own privileged identities and how and what they can do as uh, as an ally mm -hmm. um, and so i think like really reflecting on your your identities it can feel uncomfortable to do that and that's okay um it's not meant to be comfortable right we're not really taught to really speak about our our identities and so um and knowing that you know every career depending on what college you're in you know you, there are career centers and so we will work with you and unpacking mm -hmm. and reviewing your personal statement when the time comes um, so i do encourage you to reach out and connect with the career office if yeah. you are feeling like stuck in your writing process. Mm -hmm. Great, great questions. I, yeah, those were all the questions. Um, I have one to ask mm -hmm. too, um, and please feel free audience to like submit one uh, more questions too. We have until two. Um, so I was wondering, a lot of my students keep asking me about letters of recommendations. And like if they've had a professor a year ago that they maybe never asked about being a letter of recommendation um, or like if they have them now, but they're not applying for another year, like when is the kind of the appropriate time? I know you touched a base on this a little bit, but I'll, I keep getting the same question of like, is it okay to ask now, even though I don't have my personal statement ready and I might not be applying for a long time? Um, what are your thoughts on that? You know, that's a terrific question. And it's, it's, um, I think, you know, every student sort of goes through that question, because you never know when the right time is. And you never want to feel like you're inconveniencing someone, right, especially a professor. Um, however, I think that, you know, part of our job, um, and, and part of what you want to do is, is to really plant that seed in their you know, mindset that, uh, hey, I don't have a personal statement ready now. I have a draft or I have an idea or I might need some assistance to come up with an idea. And if you can reach out to that faculty member who 
you know that you've had a good relationship with, it just simply plants the idea in their head that, oh yeah, you know, this was a remarkable student and this student was very memorable to me. And I did see the growth in their, um, you know, performance in my classroom from, you know, the start of September all the way to the end of December. Um, and so you want to plant that seed early on so that once you're ready to make that ask come spring or the summertime, then they'll be ready and they'll, they've already done that reflective work or the, the work of processing through and thinking about you. Um, and so when you have that personal statement ready, it only strengthens their argument for, you know, why you're such a terrific student. Um, and and how and you know how how great the student you'll become in, in at the graduate level. So, you know, it's never too late to plant that seed, especially if you feel like you have a relationship with that professor, or maybe you want to work with that professor at the graduate level, or maybe you know that semester maybe it was in your freshman year and you want to revisit that relationship. It might allow you to then have that person not only being your reference writer, but to be a mentor along your process. So you're essentially just really, really building like the best team for you who like all have your best interests in mind all the time and early on. Um, and that's something I wish, you know, as I'm here now, I wish I had what your hosts are, are providing for you. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, that's true. And if you're like, you know, and to answer, I'm just going to add to what Chiku has mentioned too. And I like to tell my students, like, keep in touch three times a year, even if you're not going to apply for another two years, just keep in touch with them at least three times a year. Just do a check in email. Maybe you want to do like a Zoom call for 30 minutes to just kind of update your 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 professor uh, from undergrad. Like, hey, I got this internship. Yeah. Um, so Oh, here are the top three programs I'm applying for. My timeline is still up in the air, but I'm still thinking the next couple of years. You know, I hope that I can continue to stay in touch. And yeah. so again, checking it through times a year is a great way to just kind of keep it consistent. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, um, oh, two more questions. Oh, I love this conversation. I, I mean, I'm happy to continue on too. So, I mean, I can stick around for like another five minutes if um, and I'm I, I don't know about Chiku and Natasha's time as well, but I'll be here for another five minutes. A good question here. So some colleges ask for a writing sample. What is that? Mm -hmm. So a writing sample could be, or they might be asking for like a research sample. And so a writing sample might be like, maybe in your senior level courses, or maybe a really, really good paper that you've, you've worked on, you're really proud of. Um, you might want to submit that. I know that in the, um, MFA program or, or, or writing program, they might be asking for a writing sample, like other stories that you've written before in your undergraduate career and to share that so that they could understand what type of writer you are. And so that's what they're just asking about. Like what writing research have you done and what is your writing style like so that we could um, know how to best assist you or know, you know, how to, um, you know, effectively sort of, mold you to be able to write um, at a research level or academic level. Mm -hmm. So it's just a paper you've written before, I would say. But if, if they're asking specifically for a research paper, make sure you submit a research paper with like, and the research paper meaning like, it's, it's like formatted correctly with all the correct citations and everything like that. And you like, maybe you did your own research, like you collected data, and you, you know, you analyze the data and you have uh, a conclusion and, you know, you have recommendations. So all the components of research paper, so. Yeah, it all goes down to like, it depends on the program. And I hate to keep having to go back to that, but yeah, a lot of that. And I feel like what the writing sample would come from more of like a PhD program. I, I haven't, mm -hmm. I've never seen like professional schools like for speech pathology yeah. and medical school and PA asking for a writing sample. Yeah. Um, um, and then the last question here is, would it be okay to have none of your letters of recommendation from faculty? That's a great question. Uh, it goes back to, it depends, right? On the program. And um, if they are not asking for a faculty uh, reference writer, then they'll put it on their website. 
But most of the times, uh, I would say professional programs, if they may, might be looking at, you know, like maybe one or two faculty providers, and then maybe like uh, a professional reference writer. But, you know, when they are asking, when, when you're asking if they, you know, if they don't have to be faculty members, it's not to say that I'm just going to ask like my friend to write me one or something like that, right? So it has to be someone in sort of a professional uh, relationship that you have with or a, a professor, professor relationship you have with. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, I love all these questions. Okay, we're at 202 now. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chiku, for sharing and for speaking from your perspective. And you know, you're 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 working in the admissions office for the graduate program, um, and so it, it was so helpful to learn from you and to and to also learn from our participants who have asked such critical questions. Thank you, Natasha, and and yeah, I think we're I think we're all set. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. For